It always starts with this. It always starts with Bob. This is Ray. Bob, this is Stephanie. Bob, this is Peyton. This is Shane. Bob, this is Stephanie. Again, this is Jeremy. <laughs> we need you to come see us. I'm going to come see you. And then they say, dang it. But they don't say, dang it. They say, Bob, I'm serious. You need to come see me, and I need to see you soon. And what those phone calls always initiate are is that something's gone wrong in one of your fields, and you've exhausted what you know to do about it. You've called the county agent, and the county agents don't call me, do they, Paul, unless it's something they've never seen before, okay? And then I need to get there fast. Mr. Harry has been growing peanuts since he was age 16. He's 92 now. His son, this is how they met me in the field with Ray Hicks, all right? His son quit growing peanuts in 2000 because of a problem with tomato spotted wilt. In 2015, he looked at the economics. He looked at the University of Georgia's Peanut RX that Bob talks about so much, and he says, I'm going back in. And he had, where we were standing, the worst spot of wilt I've seen in many, many years. I followed what you said. I looked at the risk. We were low risk. Why do I follow you if this is all I can expect? And that's where we go. What school did you graduate from? <laughs> what I'd like to talk to you about today is something I've wanted to talk about for a long time. And I hope I don't offend anybody. And I've talked to most of the people who were involved here and got their permission. And those who aren't, aren't here, so it doesn't matter. Um, but what I will say is that for county agents, for extension specialists, and for consultants as well, Sometimes we do the best we can with the recommendation, we stand behind the recommendation, and the grower has a significant problem. And this occurred several times in 2014. And I want to talk about what those reasons were. And to be honest with you, some of them we're not even sure. We're not even sure why they happened, but we got some good ideas. But absolutely, absolutely there are times that every grower in this room is going to be frustrated with me. Probably multiple times. Okay? because things don't always turn out like we'd hoped. But I'd like to tell you why some of these cases have come up. All right? Top producers, now I'm not talking about someone who's just started growing peanuts in this talk. Okay? This is not someone who's trying to learn it. All right? Mike Newberry is one of my subjects here. Mike did not start growing peanuts last year, and he had a major problem. Okay? We're going to talk about this. I do make mistakes. There is a Mennonite corn farmer in Macon County. If he was Catholic like I am, he would have killed me. But he was Mennonite, so he didn't. I make mistakes in how I make recommendations, and I own up to them. But these are not those examples, okay? Here's what I know did not happen. Here's what I know did not happen with the growers we're going to talk about. These are not problems with calibration. These are not problems where they said they did something, but they really didn't. Okay? These are not problems with wrong timings. These are not problems with simple mistakes. Those things can happen on any farm, but with these farmers and these situations, that's not what happened. And product failures. Okay? A lot of times, growers, if something goes wrong, the first thing you do is after you get upset with the recommendation, you say the product failed. These are probably not. Products do fail, but not that often. Not as often as we have problems in the field. Okay? First one is lease spot. All right, this is Mike's field in 2015. Brian called me, Paul called me, Brian called me, Paul called me, and said, you need to come look at this. We have a similar situation from Turner County in 2014, and that is we have significant defoliation, problems with late leaf spot, late in the season, in farmers' fields who have invested in premium programs, who are successful in what they do and can't be explained easily. Okay? Severe premature defoliation from late leaf spot, strong fungicide programs. No cutting corners. No using reduced rates. No using inexpensive products to make up for the cost of peanuts. All right? And in one field, and I talked to Mike, he expects that he should have been 6,000 plus and the peanuts went about 4,000. Is that right? Okay, we're seeing the 30 to 40 percent yield loss. And he did everything that Paul and Brian told him to do and they did everything that I told them to do. Okay? Here is where the problems may lie in a situation like this. In both cases, severe premature defoliation did occur. But in both situations, in Turner County in 2014, it was with Tough Runner 511. 
In 2015, it was with Georgia 13M. Both of those, I'm not throwing them under the bus, they're both great varieties, all right? But if you look at peanut RX, if you look, those are two of the most susceptible varieties we have out there. Two of the most susceptible varieties. But Bob, we did not cut corners in Mike's Field or in Turner County. We put the fungicides out. Number one, they are susceptible. In one case, they used two chlorothalonils and five strobilurin chemistries. Seven sprays, expensive. Five strobilurin chemistries, which includes headline and abound. In the second, in Mike's case, he used Proline early emergence. He used three times chlorothalonil plus tebiconazole, two high rates of triazole, a good provost program, and two abounds. Okay? There's nothing cheap or weak in either of those programs. Here's a smoking gun. Okay? Here's a smoking gun. A weak a variety which has increased susceptibility to leaf spot, a strong fungicide program that's built around strobilurin fungicides. I'm not here to tell you that the evidence is out there, much like what Eric said. I can't tell you that there's resistance to a strobilurin chemistry. But I can tell you that as on June the 14th, two years ago, a Zoxystrobin, our go-to product initially with strobilurins, went generic. And what happens with that? We use more and more of them, okay? This is a very at-risk fungicide to begin with, the strobilurin class. It's very popular in corn, in soybeans, in peanut, and now in cotton. And the problem is, if it's overused, none of us, none of us are surprised if we start to see a combination of more susceptible and a problem with resistance. What's happening? In the peanut world right now, these fungicides, if we continue to see, if we continue to document problems where these products are used, it indicates more and more problems with the potential for strobilurin chemistries. That's why companies like Syngenta and BASF are not abandoning those products, they still have a very important use, right? But we're looking now at not only tank mixes, but pre-mixes with products like Elatus and with Preaxor. A problem in the field, strong fungicide program, defoliation, 2,000 pounds yield, anticipated loss, a weaker variety, but the smoking gun also, is it something about the fungicides, what can we do to protect it? 2015 was one of the worst white mold situations we've had. This is Blake Crabtree, new agent over in Worth County, okay? We've had some tremendous white mold problems in 2015, and you have to recognize when it's as warm as it was, when it's as warm as it was last year, even though the rainfall wasn't there, we can still have problems with white mold. If you didn't have white mold in your field last year, you can be thankful. Okay? Not everybody did, but a lot of people did. Some growers were especially frustrated with me. Especially frustrated. We did not go the cheap route, Bob. We did not invest in tebiconazole on every application. And still we had more white mold than we could imagine. Okay, give me a little bit of doubt with the, uh, with the weather we had. Right? One problem that made a group of fungicides look more at risk than they probably were was as growers had problems with white mold, they shifted to a certain group of fungicides. Okay? And so that put a lot of pressure and spotlight on those, those fungicides if there were problems. The blue at the bottom is something which is critical. This isn't the case in every situation, but most of the fields where I had complaints in Alabama, and in Florida, and especially in Georgia, were non-irrigated fields. And that's where the problem lies. You know, in a dry year, with a lot of warm temperatures, white mold is there, white mold is pushed underground. If you do not have irrigation or rainfall, it becomes more critical because we're spraying the foliage, but we want it to go down into the soil. One of Tim Brenneman's slides. 2015 for him was the perfect storm for white mold. Wet early season, we got excess of vine growth early on. Mid to late season was dry, but enough moisture to trigger white mold, and the temperatures were phenomenal for white mold. In frequent rains, we were not relocating the material. We were not moving. If you did not have irrigation to push the material down, we were not. Not that we weren't getting some benefit, but we weren't getting the benefit we wanted. Okay? What do we talk about in these situations? Okay, growers are frustrated. I used the product you said and it didn't work. It's not that the product itself wasn't working, it's you got no help, no help from the weather in these situations. All right, how do we get the product where we want it to be? The first is initial deposition. 
Application method, increased pressure, increased spray volume. You know, spraying at night. I saw Donald Chase earlier. He's probably one of three growers in the state who regularly spray at night, okay? But last year was the year Tim Burnham predicted would come when more growers are saying, let's revisit that. Because by spraying at night, you open that canopy up. Redistribution, okay? Redistribution is almost impossible if you don't have rainfall and you don't have irrigation. These nighttime sprays, they take a lot of the pressure off because you're getting the material where you need it to go. If it's dry and you're not able to get irrigation or rainfall on it, then also increasing spray volume can help you as well. Grower from 2015 had a terrible white mold, couldn't stop until I finally got up early and sprayed before daylight one morning. It shut it down. I'm not about testimonials, but I believe that's true. Where we saw white mold problems, it was unfortunate. But I don't point the finger at the fungicide. I point the finger at the kind of year we were having. Getting the most, timely irrigation. Irrigation within 24 hours or rainfall within 24 hours after an application is our recommendation. For a lot of these products, as early as 12 hours is a recommendation. Okay? Tim also visited one grower who had no white mold. No white mold in his field last year. And again, it's anecdotal, but what he did was turn the pivot on immediately after he started spraying, or stopped spraying. It affected leaf spot, but it helped him with his white mold. This is the landmine right here, okay? This is the landmine. Peanut root knot nematode. It is a vastly undermanaged problem like all nematodes are. But root knot nematodes are a severe problem, especially in the southwest corner of the state. The sandier soils, Glenn talked about soil types, root knot nematodes, nematodes are a major problem. University of Georgia stands behind our recommendation, all right, that in a tough nematode situation by planting TIF guard, and I say TIF guard, or Georgia 14N, or this TIF, uh, TIF NV high oil that's coming out, that's your best opportunity in a tough situation. I'll talk about the other options briefly as well, okay? Now here's the problem. Buster Bell, Brock Cemetery Field, I love the name of the field, okay? Decatur County. Gall ratings, we asked the county agent to pull 13 samples for us, randomly in the field, bring them back, and the ladies in my lab analyzed them for gall rating. And that's on a zero to 10 scale, that's from 0% of the root to 100% of the roots affected. And this was from a bag of seed that said Tifgar. Because I know who planted it and I know what they did. And you can see out of that, on some of those plants, up to 70% roots were affected. Okay? The immediate thing the grower asked me, or asked me through the county agent and through the grower's son-in-law, is what happened? I did what you said. You said to plant this nematode-resistant variety, and look what it did for me. All I can say at this point is every time I've done a trial, and Tim Brenneman have done a trial, and they're circled there. This is the gall ratings in my trials compared to everything else. Diff Guard and 14N, they are nearly immune. They do not get pod damage, or gall damage on the roots, okay? They do not. Is there the possibility that there's a problem with populations becoming more resistant? Perhaps there is, but everything we've done so far is said that the resistance in Tiff Guard, the resistance in 14N continues to be very effective and it's our recommendation. In fact, it's our top recommendation, okay? You can see what happens. Our varieties, then use with Telone, and then use the use new vellum total product, okay? We stand behind that. Back to Screven County, my time's almost up. Severe outbreak of tomato spotted wilt virus, Mr. Harry, 92 years old, and that's the first time he's met me. That's not how I want to meet somebody in a field that's looking bad. Scott was there, okay? I'd rather meet Scott than me, okay? All right? It was as bad as I've seen. I'm gonna tell you how bad it was. Scott said, Bob, you need to come over here too, so, all right? Share the love, right? All right? At first glance, the field should have been low risk. If we use Peanut RX, Raymond, it was low risk. The grower was frustrated and was continue, uh, considering not growing peanuts in the future. And then a boy in his drone, or Scott Monfort in his drone. It was magic, okay? Because what we can see from this picture is every time the grower took us to the field, he took us to where the trucks were parked. 
And you can see that swath in there where it's so bad. Absolutely it was horrible. It was 1997 again. All right? But with the help of Scott and his drone, the magic happened as far as explanation. Because when you look outside that area at the bottom, the rest of the field is beautiful. There was a large section in the part of the field that was bad, but most of the field wasn't bad. Okay? And in fact, what we found when we showed this, when we showed this data to Kerry, he says, you know what? He says there was a difference. There was a difference. That area of the field is lower. It's a big low spot in the field and the emergence was somewhat delayed and the emergence was somewhat uneven. And he called me back later. He said, you know what? I made 5,000 plus pounds. I made more peanuts in that field than I've never made in my life. He says, I'm not mad at you anymore. Okay? The take home message here was, yes, there was a problem in that field. Yes, Peanut RX seemed to drop for him. But once with the technology of a drone and with Scott's patient and understanding, the problem was very limited and could be explained simply by the growth in the field. Peanut RX, get those cards. We got a new app coming out. We expect you to hope you'll use that. Problems do occur in the field. But don't always think Occam's razor. What's Occam's razor? Occam's razor says the reason we had a problem with white mold is because the fungicide didn't work. Occam's razor says the reason we had spotted wilt in that field is because peanut RX fell. The reason we had Mike Newberry having premature defoliation is Bob's not very smart. Okay? Occam's razor says use the simplest answer. But in this case, this case and these cases, the answer is more complex and requires more understanding of the complete field. With that, I'll stop. I appreciate the support from the Georgia Peanut Commission and the support from the farmers.